Welcome everyone to MMSYS Doctoral Symposium. Uh, it's good to be back at MMSYS, although for me only remotely, for uh, others remote as well. Welcome to the uh, Doctoral Symposium and especially welcome to those who are on site. It's good that you made it uh, to the uh, MMSYS on site and specifically for the speakers of this session who are uh, doctoral students uh, approaching their, their PhD, please use this as an opportunity to network with uh, fellow colleague, colleagues speaking here in this session as well, but also with senior um, researchers who are on site or at different levels of their career, uh, either professors or either working in, in uh, companies uh, and discuss your ideas with them. Uh, it's up to you to do it. That's why don't wait for the opportunity. So don't wait for somebody approaching you, create the opportunity for yourself and approach them. I'm sure everyone is, uh, is, is, is more than willing to talk to you at this unique event, ACM uh, Multimedia Systems 2021. Uh, I'm the chair of the session. My name is Christian Timmerer and together with Usnur, uh, from Koch University, uh, we put together this, this program. As you see on the program, probably a lot of uh, interesting talks are coming up. Uh, the first seven I heard will be on site and I would expect that the first speaker uh, is already uh, ready to present and without uh, having too much delay here, um, please, uh, I'd like to introduce very, very briefly Jesus. Uh, who will present about multi-access edge computing for adaptive bitrate video streaming. Uh, I hope somebody on site will help him to start, to start everything. everything. Here, Here I see you too. too. Please, Please. Uh, Jesus, Jesus, the floor is yours. Uh, hello everyone, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm Jesus Aguilar, I'm from the Christian Doppel Athena Lab, Alpen Adria University at Klagenfurt in Austria. And I'm going to present my, my work uh, entitled multi access Computing for, ad for Adaptive Bitrate Video Streaming. So first I will do a brief introduction about uh, this work, then I will uh, talk about the research question and the methodology we use to, I use to, to address this uh, research question, uh, then the ongoing and future work, and I will conclude with question and answers. So video streaming uh, traffic is uh, the most popular service in, in mobile network. The, the traffic is increasing over the years. So uh, improve the content delivery and the, and the quality and assure a good quality of experience is really, really important. Also, uh, multi-asset computing uh, is an emerging paradigm, paradigm that uh, brings computational power and storage close to the, close to the user. So it reduces latency and ensure uh, a high uh, efficient network operation and improve the, the user experience. As, as we can see in the image at the right side, uh, this edge computing node is, is located in the middle uh, between the seating and the, and the client, bringing close to the client. So video streaming can, can leverage edge, edge computing advantage to, to improve the content delivery process. So for example, we have a, a storage capabilities close to the user, we have computing power to deploy mechanisms and assist the video streaming process. And also we have radio and user awareness information. So now I will talk about the research question that we have basically four. The first one is how can network assistant for us uh, be realized uh, by uh, edge computing functionality? So we basically we can we can create and deploy a mechanism, deploy at the edge and you leverage all the edge computing uh, capabilities such as storage or computing power to guide the, the video streaming process and improve the, improve the user's QE. Uh, the second research question is how to use a radio access network uh, and has client context information and perform aggregate analytics uh, in the edge. So basically at the edge, uh, we have uh, really important information, really useful information that is the radio network uh, information and the each user requirement. So this information can, can coordinate the the video stream process among all the clients, we can improve the fairness uh, between the users of the of this same uh, under the same edge computing node and also the QA. The third research question is how can we perform user behavior analysis and prediction to support low latency? 
So we have access uh, not only to current, but also historical radio and, and user uh, information at the edge. And we have the, the capabilities to, to uh, deploy machine learning techniques to uh, try to predict future network condition, future user uh, request patterns, and, and support low latency this way. The last research question is uh, how can collaboration between different uh, edge computing nodes assist the video streaming uh, process? So the catching uh, process is not limited only to the user from the same uh, under the same edge computing node. We can extend this uh, this approach to more uh, to more edge computing nodes so they can collaborate between them. And also the technology 5, 4G, 5G. There is established communi communication between base station and edge computing nodes, so we can we can use it. Now we'll talk uh, briefly about the methodology. We use the, the classic uh, word cycle of design, implement, and analyze. And it's important to, to uh, say what are the what we consider improving the, the content delivery, what we consider improving the, the, the streaming services. So for example, we focus on improving the, the QA, improve the fairness among the users, uh, increase bandwidth savings, uh, reduce latency, enable higher qualities such as uh, 4K, 8K, and also new services like uh, uh, virtual reality, augmented reality, or 360-degree video that are really demanding. And also, we, can, uh, we focus on reducing the storage needed at different uh, points of the, of the network. Now, we'll talk uh, briefly about the ongoing and future work. Uh, this, for example, this, this paper is called uh, Dynamic Segment Repackaging at the Edge for HTTP uh, Adaptive Stream. So uh, in this paper, we use CMAP. The CMAP is a common media application format that is not just supported by most uh, um, uh, devices and for most uh, service providers, but provided really great benefits such as less storage needed, bandwidth savings, savings and more cache efficiency. So in our, in our approach, uh, basically, um, uh, we have here that uh, what we do is we use CMAP in the, in the back hall and at the edge, really close to the user, we transmux to the desired media format that requests. For example, H H HLS, DAS, or Smooth HTS. So in, the clients doesn't need to change. The clients keep requesting HLS or whatever media format, but we we use the we save uh, a lot of uh, storage and bandwidth saving thanks to, to to this approach. We use three three different procedures to to. Uh, to evaluate this approach, and we have a good bandwidth savvy. Uh, this, this paper was published in the ISM 2020 conference. Uh, the next word I'm talking about is called IADAS, that stands for Edge Assist Adaptation Scheme for HTTP Adaptive Video Streaming. So basically, what we did here is uh, at the edge, we implement a mechanism that supports uh, the client based algorithm. It doesn't substitute them, it's like an extended, uh, extended capabilities. Because at the edge we have uh, awareness of other user requests, we have uh, we can support segment prefetching and different levels of subscription like premium user, basic user. So uh, this uh, mechanism that ran at the edge computing node is uh, works on the fly, so minimum latency is added, and also we we introduce a an alpha value in our algorithm that can prioritize QE or fairness uh, as uh, the as you want as your preference. We show that uh, in the result that IADAS improve uh, QA of three different uh, AVR algorithms, three different approaches, buffer based, uh, throughput based, and hybrid, and improve the QA and the fairness. Uh, this paper was uh, published at the LCN conference 2021. Uh, finally, the, the ongoing and future work, we, uh, we develop a simulator that is named Angela, HTTP Active Stream and Edge Computing uh, Simulator that is support a realistic radio layer and multimedia content, a flexible implementation of different uh, mechanisms, uh, edge computing mechanisms, including uh, machine learning support. Also have access to radio and player metric as the edge for, for this the mechanism. And also a wide variety of, uh, of metric to, to evaluate the video stream and evaluate uh, the different approach. Another word is uh, that focus on other research question is uh, deploying an edge computing mechanism that use machine learning to predict uh, techniques to predict future content, uh, segment requests, and future network condition. This way, we can support the low latency streaming. And last but not least is the inter edge computing node collaboration to establish the the, the work is focused on establishing communication between different uh, nearby 
edge computing nodes to, to for aggregate, con, con, aggregate uh, caching and content serving and uh, perform this, this collaboration. So thank you so much for, our, for your attention. And if you have any question, please don't hesitate to ask. And please also check our work in Atena Lab. Thank you. And there is one uh, time for one quick question, hopefully from the audience on site, because from the online participants, there is no question. I'm wondering if there is one question. I guess I need some help from some people on site. Oh, there is one online. Uh, in the second work, what does the context refer to? Sorry. You can answer that first, I ask. Can you repeat, Christian? Yeah, so the question is here on, uh, on from an online participant. In the second work, I think it's Didias, yes. you, you, you introduced some context. So maybe maybe you can explain what context means here. Um, yes, in, in ELS work, for example, we take into account, um, because we want to, to improve the QE and the fairness. So uh, for client side, it's, it's impossible to know what other users are requesting. So at the edge with EADAS, uh, we are we don't take into account only the individual information we take into account all the other user requests therefore we for each uh, segment request we try to to improve the fairness overall we take into account uh, this context information for all the different users okay thank you so is there an on-site question as well maybe a quick one uh, yeah yes. i have one question so um thanks for the talk very interesting um, so how does this relate to existing standardization activities like uh, SAND, shared resource allocation, for instance, or CMCD, CMSD, all the WAVE activities? Is this kind of related to what you're doing or is this uh, something separate? Yes, more or less. We have, for example, for the standardization, we are uh, focused also on the radio network information services. That is an app that they standardized uh, some years ago and they did deploy new, new uh, uh, new documents so yes we are we are trying to follow this this uh, standardization especially related to the edge computing like how to access uh, those metrics that the edge uh, computing node provides how to access for the edge for the mechanism for the video streaming supporting mechanism so how these metrics are acquired that's a uh, part of the standardization we, we focus on okay thank you but thank you very much. Let's move on to the thank next you. talk. Thank you, Jesus, again for your talk. And we are a bit under time pressure. And I'd, I'd like to introduce the second speaker, uh, who is actually a, a local. So Mehmet, he will introduce and provide us some details about improving server and client-side algorithms for adaptive streaming of non-immersive and immersive media. Mehmet, the floor is yours. Okay, hello everyone. So I'm doing my PhD in Özyen University and I will be focusing on server and client-side algorithms for adaptive streaming for both non-immersive, I mean 2D and immersive media. So uh, here are the problems that I'm focusing in my research uh, right now. So the first one is the low latency. So in this research, new methods are proposed for both client and server side. Along, uh, along with enhanced adaptive bitrate algorithms, which are applicable for both uh, 2D and 3D uh, content. Uh, so in live streaming, especially when the content is not ready yet, uh, traditional ABRs are having difficulty to pick, to pick high representation. So because the bandwidth measurement and throughput measurement is mostly wrong in, uh, in, in low latency because of the, uh, because of the problem uh, of idle periods in the network since the content is not ready yet. So we have developed a, an algorithm for that and that's already published. So it's LOL plus. And on the other hand, recently Apple has made an enhancement for low latency, which is called LLHLS protocol. And I also made, we also made an evaluation of this new protocol and competed, it, uh, yeah, uh, competed uh, this protocol and compared it with the dash.js equivalent and compared uh, how they uh, uh, actually act in the same scenario. 
And during video playback control, co video playback control is also important. So that's the third one is uh, also uh, shared yesterday in the demo session. Uh, but there was a technical issue yesterday. Hopefully today it, uh, it was much better. And, and the CMCD initial findings. Uh, so in, in September 2020, the CTA, Cons uh, Consumer Technology Association, published a new specification, uh, which was called CTA 5004, and which allows sharing information from client to the content delivery servers. So we just made a POC and showed that can just uh, make things uh, much better. Uh, uh, in uh, client side and server side. Uh, and in our adaptive streaming for content, they were encoding videos paper. The fifth one, uh, we have focused on traditional ABR problems on VBR content, variable bitrate, and we developed a new ABR, which we called SARA, and made an improvement in stall problems and rebufferings. Uh, I will show in the next slides. And lastly, streaming of immersive media is also being studied currently. Uh, so the latency plays an important role in immersive media since the required bandwidth is much, much higher than the 2D. And in order to solve that problem, we are still working on the ABR enhancement for this one. So uh, in LOL Plus, so that's the system we designed, that's the architecture. So in low latency, traditional ABRs fail to measure the throughput correctly because they count the idle periods, uh, in, especially in source uh, limited scenarios. So in order to solve that problem, we have developed a learning-based algorithm that we call LOL Plus. So it's basically using uh, SOM model, self-organizing maps, and we measure throughput, latency, buffer, uh, rebuffering, and number of switches to evaluate the results, and calculated the distance uh, for our future map uh, using the SOM model here. Uh, and that's, that's how we made the switch decisions by using this unsupervised learning, learning technique, and it's already published. And this, the second problem that uh, I'm fo uh, we were focusing on was the Apple's LLHLS. So Apple uh, just created parts instead of dash.js. So uh, instead of chunks, we have uh, parts and playlist updates here. So we made an evaluation, uh, as you can see, two different scenarios uh, in this uh, basic paper, actually. So the first one is uh, uh, the uh, dash.js implementation, the equivalent of the uh, Apple's uh, uh, implementation actually, and the results that we saw was uh, 65 times uh, times more requests in, uh, in uh, Apple's implementation, and we observed here four times higher CPU. Uh, so that was when we were just doing that was experimental, uh, and we used beta in Apple's implementation. It might be uh, public right now. And that's the content aware playback sp speed control. So that's the demo of our present yesterday. So with our implemented content aware playback controller, uh, we have succeeded to have a smoother playback speed here. So the details of the algorithm is presented in the demo. And our interactive demo link is also supplied at the end of the slides. And CMC, the common media client data. So uh, that's the results we had. Uh, so with our setup for two network profiles, we use Cascade and Spike, Spike profiles. Uh, we have created a basic server band allocation algorithm. The algorithm was very basic. It was just uh, making decisions based on the buffer. So basically just client just sends the buffer information and server just makes uh, a uh, resource allocation based on that buffer level. Uh, and we just measured that uh, the results are here and the for those two methods, profile, cascade, and spike, respectively, so average rebuffer duration is reduced by 74% and 83 for spike profile, and maximum rebuffer profile is uh, reduced by 72, 72 and uh, 78%, just implementing by this uh, simple buffer sending from client to the server side. So that can be enhanced more. That's just the initial findings we had. And that's the algorithm that we call SARA, so the adaptive string for content aware encoding videos. So we have created a segment aware alg algorithm uh, and evaluated SARA algorithm with VBR content with segment size. And we had that segment, th segment size as metadata here. And we have observed a drop in total rebuffer duration in SARA in all of the cases as shown in the table. Uh, we also created Aurelius and, and MPC based bandit prediction uh, with our algorithm and the details are explained in the paper. 
And the last one is the immersive media. It's still in progress. So uh, viewport dependent delivery is a common technique uh, used in immersive media to reduce the bandwidth uh, required. Uh, so viewport tiles in high quality and background tiles and maybe margin tiles in lower quality. So by using head motion, uh, we have proposed a way of calculating adaptive margins and created early results for that. And we also proposed a new concept that we call as negative margins. And we are currently working on that. The idea of negative margins is to give the priority to the tiles in head motion direction and download tiles in the viewport that are hardly noticeable by the user in low quality. So that's a trade-off. So that's something we are still working on right now. And those are the list of pub publications and source codes available, and also demo. Uh, and thanks for your, for your listening. And if you have any questions, I can answer them. Thank you. Uh, do we have any question on site? If yes, then we can take that. I would have one, one quick question. So in your work, what means immersive media here? Maybe you can briefly define that. Sorry, sorry, I, I didn't hear that. What means what means immersive media? What is your definition of immersive oh, media uh, in your thesis? It's 3D freedom, not six degree of freedom. It's 3D VR content. That's, that's what I'm working on with HMD, okay. with Oculus actually. Uh, so it's a VR content, a 360 okay. video about three three degrees of freedom okay good thank you very much Mehmet again thank you and let's move on to the next speaker and the next talk who is Banis from uh, University of Oslo and he will present rising cellular multimedia IOT the call for an application aware resource management hi Hi everyone, I'm Panis and I'm going to share with you uh, my PhD project. Um, okay. Um, as you probably know, we are, uh, there are so many applications coming with 5G, uh, which is we can uh, put them into three main categories, URLC, uh, EMBB, and uh, massive MMTC or massive machine type communications, but they are really different and they have uh, really different characteristics. For example, URLC applications need uh, to send the pack their package as soon as possible and in a highly reliable pass. Uh, because for example, um, these applications are like uh, remote surgery, haptics, uh, autonomous cars, so they need uh, to be sent their packets really soon. But for example, EMBB applications, which is the next generation of the mobile applications we use these days, they need high data rate, so they are different. Um, okay. okay. But also multimedia IoT applications can uh, pour fuel to this fire because they need high data rates and they, are, um, they can be really different from each other. Some of them are mobile and some of them are stationary and they uh, they're like cameras and they are just in one place some of them uh, need the high data rate but some of them just need high uh, uplink data rate so there's there are so many different requirements of these applications as a starting point of my phd project we studied uh, connected cars as a use case of uh, multimedia applications which, because we have so many different applications in connected cars um, for example, um, <clears throat> there are some passengers on the car that they want to like watch videos or play games, but on the other hand, car itself wants to uh, send the packets, uh, the sensor net sensor networks to the their manufacturers, and uh, these are the um, sensitive latency sensitive services. So we have so many applications and connected cars. So we started from this to see, uh, okay, uh, how they are really different and uh, if actually they are different or not. So, um, okay. okay. Oh, okay. 
So uh, we start with the uh, putting devices of a UK mobile oper um, operator to three categories, smartphones, connected cars, and other IoT devices, and we studied their characteristics. First thing, uh, we studied their uh, radio technology that they uh, supported. As you can see that uh, mostly uh, smartphones um, support 5G, 4G, but... But uh, uh, on the other hand, IoT devices are mostly 2G enabled. But connected cars are somehow in between, so they um, they are supporting 4G. But they also, if mobile operator decided to shut down 2G network, they are they are just into trouble uh, as well as um, IoT applications, which they are thinking about it. And some of them, like AT and T, I guess they uh, starting to shut down 2G networks. But uh, in the next place, we um, studied uh, the amount of signaling they generated. As we, as you can see, uh, um, smartphones are still the most active devices on the networks, but also connected cars generate more uh, signaling as uh, rather than I other IoT devices, which we can explain it as a uh, their mobility because they are mobile on the network and they connect to many cells. So uh, they are handover and they uh, just generate more signals than other IoT devices, which is a stationary on the network. Uh, so far, we saw just the two examples of their difference between these applications and these devices. But also, we want to see if the connected cars itself are the same and they behave the same on the network or not. So we just um, <coughs> choose six car uh, brands on the network and we uh, I studied their um, characteristics, which you can see as an example. It just uh, that it, this uh, plot shows the um, amount of uh, the difference between the numbers of uh, uh, signaling they generated, which you can see that uh, it's not um, just the difference between uh, smartphones and connected cars and devices and other IoT devices, but also connected cars itself uh, are different from each other. So we need uh, to take into account these differences into the uh, future uh, cellular networks. So in 5G era, in the, in the future cellular networks, they propose a network slicing, which uh, they can um, provide the requirements of different uh, um, applications. Mm -hmm. Network slicing is defined as a logical network on the same, uh, same shared uh, physical networks. Uh, but I don't want to explain it. I just <laughs> want to explain my project. I have uh, two main uh, aim, um, two main goal in my PhD project. First one is uh, how to differentiate different services on the network, which uh, because, uh, for example, these days we send um, mostly network, uh, mostly packets and traffics on the network as a best effort but so we the first uh, aim we have is uh, how to differentiate them and how to how we can know them and their characteristics and their requirements uh, and then uh, we start our project from here and uh, you just saw some examples of high data analysis that we d did but also we uh, have a plan to continue their our analysis to the uh, low level data so we know them better and then uh, as the second point, we wanted to design a learning-based network slicing method to, um, to allocate, a resource man uh, allocate resources uh, to the application level so that uh, they could um, get their requirements and also we can um, maximize the utilization of the network. Thank you. Uh, thank you for attention. Now we can get your questions. Thank you. Maybe we have time for one quick question. I don't see something online, but maybe on site something. So, but maybe, yeah, okay, no question. I have one quick question, maybe in terms of the data rate, do you have any, any numbers here on, on which kind of data rate you can expect in your use case? Uh, you mean connected cars? Yes. Um, it's a good question, but um, I don't know actually the number. 
um, but yeah, probably it's uh, lower than a smartphones for now because uh, probably nowadays people don't usually use their network on their cars. They usually smart um, use their smartphones. But uh, if we go to the point that the people use their con their cars as an internet connection, probably it should be as same as the smartphones because it's. Uh, they have similar applications like video streaming or games or something like that, which is a uh, high um, okay. scoring. Good. Thank you very much. And uh, let's move on to the next speaker. And I would appreciate if the next speaker comes up, who is Neha from Simon Fraser University. And Neha will represent uh, her work about enabling wide adoption of hyperspectral imaging. The floor is yours. Yeah, so hello everyone. I am Neha Sharma. I am a PhD student at Simon Fraser University working with Professor Mohammad Hafida. So today I'm going to introduce my PhD thesis topic enabling wide adoption of hyperspectral imaging on consumer gate devices such as smartphones. So smartphones are the computing platforms of the future. People rely on their mobile devices for numerous applications. The hardware and software resources on these devices are continuously improving. For example, the recent iPhone 12 Pro and now the 13 Pro smartphone has a LiDAR sensor and multiple camera modules for better depth depth estimation and image quality in low light conditions. These smartphone cameras in general provide us with uh, three bands, that is red, green, and blue in the visible light spectrum. <clears throat> and RGB sensors are designed in such a way to imitate the cone cells present in the human vision system. On the contrary, hyperspectral images contain information in wide range of the electromagnetic spectrum. The captured images contain rich information even beyond the human vision. And the spectral information captured in different bands can be used to produce spectral signature, which can be used to identify different materials in the scene. So these unique spectral signature can enable various applications on smartphones not possible before. For example, a consumer intending to buy avocado for guacamole can check the degree of the ripeness using a mobile app. Similarly, this technology could also be useful in low budget clinics for early detection of skin cancer. Now, if we closely look at the RGB uh, camera design, the Bayer filter is used in front of the CMOS sensor to capture three wide bands. In general, CMOS sensors are sensitive in both visible and uh, the infrared range. So an IR cutoff filter is used to discard information beyond the visible spectrum. On the other hand, in case of hyperspectral cameras, same CMOS sensor is used to capture multiple bands in both visible and near infrared range by splitting the light using prism or grating. Uh, in general, these uh, hyperspectral cameras suffer from four major challenges. The biggest challenge is the cost. These devices are expensive in the order of around 20 to 30,000 US dollars. Second, the hardware system is complex and the acquisition is very slow. Third, the data captured is huge, uh, which poses an issue for storage and transmission. And the last is due to the relative motion between the camera and the scene, video acquisition is not possible. So the goal of this thesis is to address these challenges and enable a simpler hyperspectral imaging system on mobile devices, which we call as Mobi Spectral. So I divide my research problem into four sub problems. First is to reconstruct the hyperspectral bands from the RGB images, which are easily captured by uh, using a smartphone camera. So I proposed a deep learning based reconstruction model to produce image to image mapping between RGB and uh, target hyperspectral bands for vein visualization application. So my reconstruction model is optimized for a specific application and the first one to produce reconstruction beyond the visible range. So please refer to the paper. Uh, this, this work is published in ACM Multimedia Systems 2020. My second direction is towards modifying one of the mobile camera systems, exploiting its full potential, in, especially in the spectral domain, and enabling many more applications on smartphones not possible before. So the reconstruction model is restricted by recovering the fine details which are present in the visible range. 
So to further exploit the spectral power of the CMOS sensor, my key idea is to carefully select few additional bands in the visible and the near infrared range and design a unique multispectral filter array optimized for hyperspectral reconstruction. My third goal is to provide a platform for mobile developers to easily develop any new hyperspectral uh, application using cloud services and mobile APIs. The cloud service will allow all the developers to train their own reconstruction model for a specific application and will provide the flexibility to change the number of reconstruction bands. Using our cloud service and mobile APIs, users will be able to produce an on-device inference, reducing latency, maintaining user privacy, and producing cost effectiveness. Uh, so the last goal is to support the hyperspectral imaging in diverse illumination condition. I presented this work in MMSYS 2021 today in the previous session. So the, uh, the problem statement is that the additional hyperspectral imaging systems have a strict illumination conditions to use halogen light sources for indoor applications which are expensive, not environment friendly and can damage the samples sensitive objects in the scene. But common light sources such as LED and CFL can damage the uh, hyperspectral bands in the invisible part of the spectrum. Thus, I worked on a learning-based approach uh, with my colleague to recover damaged bands and enable hyperspectral in a diverse illumination condition. So please refer to our paper for more details. So in conclusion, the goal of this thesis is to design and implement next generation hyperspectral imaging systems that are cost effective and robust. So cost effective is uh, effectiveness is achieved by uh, bringing some of the hyperspectral imaging features to the smartphones using deep learning methods. Robustness is achieved by mitigating the effects of various illumination conditions. So my proposed system, Mobi Spectral, will develop novel algorithms uh, that could potentially change the way hyperspectral imaging systems and applications are designed and used. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I wonder if we have any question on site. There is one question online, but I'm not sure it's for this or the previous talk about the data set. Maybe you mentioned the data set and this question is here. If this is public domain. Okay, so we generally don't have any data set for hyperspectral images and uh, and my goal is to design various applications. So the a big chunk of this work will have, uh, like will be invested in collecting specific application specific data set. And uh, till now I have collected data set for vein visualization application, uh, which is used in my first paper. Second, I collected uh, uh, data set about food quality inspection, which includes the apples and avocados testing of ripeness. And uh, I collected few data sets about different materials like uh, paper or wood or plastic. So yeah, this is an ongoing process and we will be adding more uh, data sets in this particular area. Okay, thank you very much. I think we need to move on. We are a bit okay. behind our schedule already. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, let's move on to the next speaker who is Min from Klagenfurt and who will present about policy-driven dynamic adaptive, uh, dynamic HTTP adaptive streaming player environment. Hello, I would I'm appreciate in... from, from everyone to, to really uh, yeah, speed up a bit and try to respect the time because we are running out of time. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Ming Nguyen from uh, Athena Lab. Today, I would like to present my uh, doctoral program about policy driven dynamic HTTP adaptive streaming player environment. My presentation will uh, start with the um, introduction and state of the art. Then, I will introduce the research uh, questions and methodology. For, uh, the final section is the um, uh, publications and physical work. Well, uh, in HTTP Adaptive Streaming or HAS, we will focus on the client side, especially the adaptive uh, bitrate algorithm and also the um, uh, throughput estimation. Besides, the, the network part on, can be uh, investigated in my program. And uh, our, our main target is that we need to address the trade-off among the quality, the content, and the time. Let's move to the state of the art. Well, as a client side, 
uh, as you may know, uh, as a, uh, IBR algorithms have been studied um, intensively. Uh, however, none of them is a one size fit all approach. Also, as a, uh, uh, as a network site, we have seen many emerging and future networking approaches, such as num uh, 5G and uh, uh, SDN. And here the question is that how can we utilize them to enhance the hash player performance? Going to the resource questions, well, we determined five resource questions in our topic. <clears throat> the first one is that how to <clears throat> provide a generic mechanism for hash players that meets the user needs. <clears throat> Here we need to trade off among the quality of the video, the time, and also the uh, content complexity for each use case, like live streaming or video on demand. The second question is how to enable efficient support for server or network assisted hosts. Well, here we can try to share the, the server or network information among the host players to ensure that we have quality fairness among multiple clients. Going to the third question, we want to answer how to add support for emerging or future networking aspects or product and par uh, paradigms. We will investigate <coughs> how to utilize their uh, features like um, server posts of HTTP 2 and 3 to improve has player uh, <coughs> performance. For the, uh, for the next question, how to, uh, how to enable client-based quality enhancement options for has players? Here we, we will apply deep neural networks such as a super re re uh, resolution to avoid the, uh, the dependence on the network conditions by improving <coughs> the quality of the, of the video downloaded in the client. And last but not least, in the fifth questions, we will answer, the <coughs> answer how to integrate advanced analytics options and various prediction models for hash players. Here we will focus on uh, utilizing machine learning based methods such as long short term memory to pro uh, propose some uh, prediction models. Let's go to the methodology. Well, in, uh, in our doctoral program, I, we will fo uh, follow the design paradigms introduced by ACM, which includes four steps. Uh, stating requirements, stating specification, designing and uh, implementations. <coughs> and the last step is testing. Now I would like to introduce some uh, of my publications and future work. <coughs> the first one is has to be an, an HTTP2 based retransmission technique. Here, uh, our research goal is that we want to improve the low quality segments downloaded at the client and also to fill <coughs> the quality gap of the client. <coughs> the question is how? Well, we will use, uh, we will retransmit some downloaded segments of the client with higher quality <coughs> versions uh, by uh, utilizing HTTP2 features like uh, multiplexing, server push, stream priority, and uh, stream, termi uh, <coughs> stream ter uh, termination. Our experimental results show that we can decrease up to 70% of the lowest quality segments. Meanwhile, we can improve up to 13% of the QoE. The second work is <coughs> which a uh, user-centric uh, bitrate adaptation. Well, <coughs> we observe that downloading a high bitrate segment can, remove, uh, can uh, result in more transfer data or high data cost, more download time, or high buffer cost. However, we can achieve higher quality. So the, uh, the idea is that we would like to uh, formulate a uh, overall cost of each representation that is a greater sum of throughput cost, buffer cost, and quality cost. So the, uh, the ABR or WISH will select <coughs> the representation that has the lowest uh, overall cost. <coughs> the the uh, results show that we can uh, decrease or we can save up to 36% of the data usage as a client, but we can uh, improve up to 18% of the QoE. 
So for the ongoing and future work, we're going to focus on <coughs> the last uh, three research questions. For the uh, second question, we will define a notion of QoE fairness and design an optimi some optimi uh, optimization models with the uh, input as uh, like server or network information <coughs> to maximize the QoE fairness. To answer the fourth question, we want to apply the deep neural networks like super re re uh, resolution to improve low quality segments of the client. And uh, for the last question, we will work on the QoE prediction models and also in, uh, investigate appropriate client metrics to send to the server and improve the QoE. Well, that's all for my presentations. Thank you for your attention and I'm happy to answer the questions. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe one on-site question. If there is any. Okay. So there is a, oh yeah, there is one question for which, how do you determine the different weights in a weighted sum? Uh, thank you for the question. Well, for the weights, we can, uh, we uh, provide an, uh, the uh, flex flexibility to the, uh, to the customer, to, to, uh, to, to the customer to uh, change the weight of the, of the model. It, if they want to, 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 uh, to save a lot of data for the clients, they can set a lower weight and, uh, also, if they uh, want to have a want to have a higher quality, they can uh, set a higher weight for the for the model. Okay, thank you. Let's move on to the next speaker, uh, who is Ivan from the University of Zagreb, and he will present about performance estimation of encrypted video streaming in light of end-user playback related interactions. Uh, thank you, Christian. Uh, hello, MC's community. Uh, I'm glad to be here with you in Istanbul. Uh, my name is Ivan Bartoletz, and I'm a PhD student at the University of Zagreb, Croatia. Uh, my main research activities are in the area of uh, adaptive video streaming uh, with focus on in-network quality of experience estimation, which is in short a uh, degree of delight uh, of the user using a service or an application. Uh, due to the adoption of uh, traffic encryption employed by major video platforms and due to the dynamics introduced by HTTP adaptive video uh, streaming, it has become increasingly challenging for uh, network operators to monitor service performance at the application level, uh, which is crucial uh, when, aiming, when aiming to estimate uh, end users' QE. A number of solutions uh, has been proposed that infer uh, application performance uh, in terms of key performance indicators uh, or overall QE solely based on analysis of encrypted network traffic or that map uh, traffic patterns to QE uh, by using machine learning techniques. Uh, the process of machine learning model training in uh, most of these studies is performed as follows. Uh, first, uh, ground true data is collected al alongside network layer data uh, second, uh, data is processed, relevant features are uh, selected and machine learning models are trained. And third, uh, models are evaluated on yet uh, unseen data and in case of poor model performance, uh, the process related to model training and uh, model evaluation is repeated. However, uh, most studies in, in this area tend to idealize uh, user behavior, collecting data without any kind of uh, playback-related uh, interactions, which shows a clear research gap when it comes to uh, user behavior implications on QA monitoring. And uh, as a consequence, it is questionable to what extent uh, the proposed models are applicable in uh, real-world network scenarios. 
Uh, in this dissertation, uh, the focus will be on uh, end-user playback-related interactions such as pausing, seeking, and uh, video abandonment as various uh, playback interactions result with uh, different traffic patterns which then impact the machine learning-based uh, QE estimation models uh, that rely on features uh, extracted from uh, network traffic. To illustrate uh, the implications of user behavior um, uh, on uh, uh, QE monitoring of YouTube KPIs, uh, a study has been conducted um, for which two datasets were collected with one dataset not containing any interactions uh, and another dataset containing pause, seek and video abandonment interactions. Uh, the results show that models trained on datasets without, inter without user interactions perform worse when estimating videos uh, that include user interactions. And additionally, uh, once we include videos with uh, user interactions in the training dataset, uh, the performance of those models uh, is much higher when estimating video sessions uh, that include uh, user interactions. Uh, the main objective of this research is to uh, specify an approach for uh, in-network estimation of QE-related KPIs of encrypted video sessions containing uh, user playback interactions and uh, viewed on mobile devices. And the research hypothesis is that the inclusion of uh, user playback interactions in the data collection and machine learning model training process can increase the performance of in-network QE-related KPI estimation models in the wild as compared to models trained on uh, data excluding interactions. Uh, the research will be conducted in uh, four interlapping phases. Uh, in the first phase, a model of user behavior uh, of uh, a model of user behavior uh, when interacting with video player will be proposed. Uh, in the second phase, a KPI estimation methodology, which includes data collection, model training, and uh, KPI monitoring, will be specified. In the third phase, uh, the proposed um, framework will be implemented and uh, data collection campaigns will be conducted in uh, laboratory environments. And in the final phase, machine learning models will be trained and their performance will be evaluated. The expected scientific contributions are, first, a model of playback related user interactions for adaptive video streaming services on mobile devices. Second, a methodology based on machine learning and a defined interaction model for in-network estimation of QE-related KPIs of encrypted video streaming in light of uh, user interactions. And third, models for in-network estimation of QE-related KPIs of adaptive video streaming services derived by using the proposed methodology. So um, I hope you find this presentation interesting and uh, if you have any questions or comments, uh, feel free to contact me. Thank you. Thank you, Ivan. And we have one question online from Bing Wang and he wants to know a bit more about where this data is collected and the general experimental setup and the features used to infer use of behavior. Maybe you can briefly, you know, very, very briefly uh, address these questions. Uh, yeah, it's <laughs> the, the answer should be very long for this question. By the way, thank you for the questions. So basically data regarding uh, user behavior is connected in the wild by using some background Android uh, application or services. And uh, data regarding uh, collecting data regarding uh, ground truth data or and uh, network layer data is connected is collected uh, in the laboratory environment and i hope uh, i answered the question thank you i guess everything else needs to be addressed elsewhere and we need to move on uh, to the next speaker who is akram uh, and from Klagenfurt, and he will present about machine learning based video coding enhancements for HTTP adaptive streaming. Okay. The floor is yours. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Ekrem Sinke, and welcome to my Dr. Sertosian presentation. This will be the. Uh, okay. okay, now it's works. So, Tom. 
So this will be the agenda of my presentation, and let's just start with the introduction, please. Uh, we all know, can you just, we all know video is quite popular, and when we take a look at the statistics, it makes up a quite large portion of the whole internet traffic, and we can see a shift towards a higher resolution content in the recent years. And when it comes to delivering the video, HTTP adaptive streaming is the default solution for that. And here we extract multiple representations of a single video and store them in different qualities and resolutions. And of course, to prepare them, we use the video encoding. It consists of multiple building blocks like block partitioning, motion compensation, transformation and quantization, and the entropy coding. And on the decoder side, we do the inverse of these operations. And at the end, we have the decoded frame ready to be played. And when we look at the video codex, we can see that each iteration increased the bitrate saving at the cost of increased encoding time complexity. And in fact, considering this increasing time complexity of the codex and also the content complexity that we see with the higher resolution, there is a need to improve the video encoding performances. And in this doctoral study, we want to do this enhancement with the help of machine learning. And when we took a look at the video encoding pipeline, we can see many places that we can utilize for the machine learning. And we came up with four research questions. The first one is about how can we efficiently provide multi-rate representations over a wide range of resolutions for HAS. And because we saw that the content resolution is increasing, so we will need more representations. So it's better to address this. When we take a look at the literature, we can see a choosing a reference representation and using that information is the way to go. The second research question is how can we improve the performance of video codings with the help of machine learning? We saw that they are getting more and more complex and there is still a set room for improvement using machine learning. In the literature, we see ML-based in block improvements. Also, we see some attempts from end-to-end -end video codecs using machine learning. Third question is how can we improve the visual quality of videos using machine learning? Uh, we saw there are a lot of ML-based image restoration methods and weakness are mostly ignored. If we can do this, we can improve the quality of experience for users. There are a lot of ways to do this, like super resolution, in the filtering, denoising, etc. And finally, how can we use the machine learning to improve the perceptual quality assessment for videos? I mean, finding a reliable metric that is correlated with the human perception system is important, and there are some problems with the current objective metrics we use. BMAF is the best example of this in the literature, but still it has some problems, so we believe this can also be improved. Moving on the methodology, we will follow the design implement analyze cycle. We will just keep repeating this until we improve the solutions that we build. And that also resulted with some publications already. Uh, first off, we, we targeted the multi-rate encoding, and here we checked the state of that. We saw that using the highest or the lowest quality resolution as the reference is the way to go. Here, what we did was we first encoded the highest quality representation, used that information to encode the lowest quality, and then we combined the information from both of them to encode the remaining representation. And this was the time graph we had. We managed to achieve some quite time saving for the dependent representations. However, there was a slight problem here, as you can see we cannot achieve any time complexity saving for the highest quality representation. To address that, in our second study, we wanted to uh, examine what is the best starting point for this. And what we did was we first encoded the middle quality representation. Then we encoded the representation based on the quality levels, and we either applied the upper or lower bond for the encoding them. And this was the time graph we had. We managed to save some time complexity reduction here, but it was not as good as we wanted to be. And the third study, we focused on how can we improve this with the help of machine learning. Here, what we did was we used a convolutional neural network to predict the CTU depth decision. And we just used the lowest quality as the representation, uh, sorry, reference representation. We extracted the information from them, and we only focused on the parallel encoding. So we applied this methodology only for the bottleneck status, which were the highest two quality representation in our case. And this was the time graph we had at the end. More or less, we managed to achieve a balanced encoding time complexity for all representations. And finally, we wanted to extend this for the multi-resolution scenarios as well. Here, we, took, no, sorry. we picked the highest quality representation from the lowest resolution as the reference, encoded that information, and then we trained different CNNs for different QPN resolution levels, and we applied this decision boosting. 
At the end, we got this time graph. Uh, we managed to save some quite time saving, both for parallel encoding and also individual encodings. And for the ongoing and the future work, so this was the timeline more or less for my doctoral study. We started with the research question one about multi-rate encoding and the literature review. That resulted with our first publication for DCC20 and followed up by the second publication for MMM conference. After that, we went to take a look at about how can we address research question two. We started with the literature review and combining research questions one and two was our first publication for VSIP conference. And following that, we had the extension for multi-resolution scenario in the IOJSP paper, uh, sorry, journal. As of now, we are working on addressing the research question three. How can we improve the video quality using the machine learning? And more specifically, we try to do a mobile play optimization with the help of super resolution on the mobile devices. After that, we will be focusing on the research question four a bit. And then we still want to address the research question one a bit more and also the research question too. And at the end, I will just conclude it with my thesis. This was all for my materials presentation. Thank you for your time. And if you want to reach me, you can use these channels. I will be happy to answer the questions now. Thank you, Ekrem. I don't see an online question and we don't have a question. Uh, on site, so also in the interest of time, I think. Uh, let's sorry. just move on. Sorry, sorry. Uh, can I have a question? Yes. Uh, Akram, uh, I want to ask you about like the super res res resolution in the mobile devices. Uh, I know like the machine learning is like computational task, and how can you like make it make it like process the video in the real time in the mobile? Thank you. Thank you for the question. Yeah, this is the main challenge we are facing right now. I mean, mobile processing GPUs are getting more and more powerful day by day, but still they are not at the level that we wanted them to be. But we can see some room that we can apply it and manage to make it in real time. Maybe it will not boost as good as the computer version of the super resolution network, but still we can get some improvement. So, thank you. Thank you very much. And let's move to the uh, next speaker. And we move also now to the online uh, presentations. And the next speaker is hopefully already ready, starting to share his screen and presentation uh, is coming from Pedro from University College of London. And uh, he will present about graph-based network for dynamic point cloud prediction. Uh, hello, my name is Pedro Gomes. I'm a PhD student at University College of London. My supervisor is Professor Laura Toni. While I would prefer to be there in person, I'm still happy to present my PhD research topic that is graph-based network or dynamic point cloud prediction. So as you know, Point clouds are a very flexible and rich representation of 3D space. However, one of their main disadvantage is that they take a lot of memory. For this reason, the main goal of my PhD is to develop a novel compression technique for dynamic point cloud. So a common strategy in dynamic point cloud compression is to encode the difference between two known consecutive frames. However, a more efficient strategy can be to encode the difference between the prediction and the actual frame. On the decoder side, it will be able to make identical prediction and given the difference, reconstruct the original frame. This way we can save a lot of bandwidth and memory space. So the key for compression in this case is efficient prediction. The main goal of my PhD is to make point cloud prediction using compression. However, this is a very difficult challenge since point clouds are an unordered set of points. They have no relations between the points. This means that there is no point to point correspondence across time from where we can extract temporal correlations or motion vectors. 
to tackle this challenge, I propose to use a graph-based approach. This means that for a point cloud, I will be constructing a graph by connecting each point to its closest neighbors. Then, this way I can model point relationships. I will use this to learn topological information from each point that I will then use to establish correspondence between points across time, from where I can extract temporal correlations. So to this end, I will propose an interactive framework, which allows us to predict point clouds using RNN cells. So at each interaction, the network will take one input point cloud and output a prediction of the next point cloud. So the architecture is composed of two phases, dynamic extraction phase, where the point cloud dynamic behavior is captured in the form of point states, and the point cloud reconstruction phase, where the learned states are used to output a prediction. So in the dynamic extraction phase, as a key novelty, we pre-process the point cloud to extract the point features that will carry the local geometrical information. Specifically, a graph neural net and these features. And you can see that these features allow to segment the point cloud into multiple regions. We will send these features to a graph RNN cell. So since the graph RNN is a recurrent model, at each interaction, it will take into consideration the frame, the present frame, and the frame in the past. So the cell will construct a spatial temporal graph using these two frames based on the geometrical features. This means that points that share a similar topology will be connected. For example, a point belonging to my hand in the present will be connected to a point also belonging to my hand in the past. This way we can extract temporal correlations. So we run after the graph RNN cells, the point cloud reconstruction phase begins. We propagate the states to a fully connected layer and we learn motion vectors that allow us to make the prediction of the next point cloud. So we already have some early results. Here we I show an example of a person running forward. We can see our network is able to make some accurate predictions of his next movement, but this prediction is not perfect. We also can see a lot of deformation, especially in the legs and in the shoes. So, before we move on to the next phase that is developing the compression architecture, I want to tackle this deformation issue. So first, we plan to apply a regularizer to smooth the motion vectors according to the geometrical features. So this means that points belonging to the same part of the body will be forced to have the same motion vectors. Also, we believe some part of this deformation is caused by the loss function. We recognize the limitations in the current point cloud metrics, and we will hope to provide some contribution in this field in the future. Finally, we propose to construct more effective spatial temporal graphs by clustering the points according to their states. So this means that we will preserve a high density of points in the regions of high movement and discard points in the static, static regions. We hope this allows us to focus more on this movement and uh, as well as saving computer resources. Uh, thank you for listening to my PhD topic. Do you have any questions? Thank you very much. We have one uh, question from online from Alan, and he's questioning is the point color has influence in the prediction? Uh, yes, yeah, that's a good question. We run some tests, I'm doing it with color and without color, 
and the results show that we can build a spatial temporal graph more effective using color because you can find correspondence between points better this way. It still does not solve the deformation problem, but uh, it produces better results. Thank you very much. And let's move on to the next uh, speaker who is Ali Reza. Please start sharing your screen. He will present about optimizing QE and latency of live video streaming using edge computing and in-network intelligence. My name is Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Ah, okay. <laughs> okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Ani Reza from the Atinal Lab. And welcome to my presentation entitled Optimizing QE and Latency of Live Video Streaming Using Edge Computing and In Network Intelligence. In this presentation, first, I uh, introduce the challenge and uh, challenge of the research crash uh, in the live streaming context uh, and uh, introduce, introduce my research question, then uh, talk about the research methodology contribution and uh, try to cover future works publication schedule on my work plan in the thesis. After a broad uh, literature review, uh, we highlighted the following uh, challenge for the live streaming context. The first one is the end-to-end -end latency that is a crucial query parameter that is conflicting with the other query parameters like the video quality, uh, low offering rate, and so on. The, uh, the second one is that uh, the common transmission protocol like the TCP is not suitable for the uh, video streaming due to a uh, long RTT. The third one is the scalability, especially for the uh, popular event with a huge number of the requests. And finally, the true fairness among the user with the share bottleneck. By taking account the, uh, the mention challenge, we came up with the following research question. First, how to deliver a smooth video streaming with the high quality to increase the QE by uh, using the edge computing and in-network intelligence. The second one is how to decrease the end-to-end -end latency by leveraging in-network intelligence like the VNF, STM, uh, uh, and uh, in various transmission uh, and various trans transmission protocols. The third one is how uh, can a new paradigm like the NFP, STM, and edge computing can help the scalability issue while meet the expected, uh, expected query by the clients. And finally, how we can uh, leverage the edge capability to increase the query fairness among the user with the share button. In the, fair, uh, uh, the quantitative research is selected as a research methodology and a spiral model for the implementation. The thesis goal is to, uh, to address the research question by employing the edge, and, uh, edge capability and information and leveraging the state of the art technology like the STN and NFP. And also employing the suitable transmission protocol in each live streaming phase. In the first step, and to address the research question one and three, uh, we propose a framework named OSCAR that leveraged the STN, F, NFP, and multicast ABL. The main idea of the OSCAR is to, uh, uh, to use the multicast ABR uh, and uh, transmit just uh, the highest requested quality by the clients from the origin server to some virtual transcoder in the network that are uh, closer to the clients and provide the other requested qualities by uh, clients uh, through the transcoding and consequently transmit them to the client. By using this approach, Oscar could uh, save the backhaul of the network 
remarkably. Uh, for more detail of the uh, Oscar, you can refer to our paper that published in the mid uh, 2020 and uh, uh, our paper in the uh, TNSM paper. The OSCAR uh, used the conventional transcoding method that is uh, time consuming and uh, intensive uh, computation task. Let me take uh, this challenge and, uh, uh, and, uh, and introduce delay and cost by the transcoding and the direction of the research question one to three, we propose a novel transcoding method uh, that called a lightweight transcoding at the edge. The idea of the LWD is to extract some metadata during the encoding process at the origin server and reuse them at the edge to reduce the transcoding time and cost. Uh, the implementation result of the LWD showed that it can reduce the transcoding uh, time up to 90% compared with the conventional transcoding method. Also, it showed that the extracted metadata are relatively small compared with the uh, representation itself. Also, uh, the experimental evaluation show up to 60% cost saving compared with the state-of-the-art approach. Uh, for the future work, uh, and quadrus research question one to three, we plan to extend the LWT by adding new parameters. And also in the same direction, we are going to study the end-to-end -end latency by employing uh, different transmission protocol in each phase of the live, uh, live streaming. And finally, leveraging the and using the available information at the edge to propose a a framework uh, to assist the uh, client adaptation for better fairness. And in this slide, uh, you can see some of our publication in this context. And uh, in the last slide, you can see my schedule and work plan for my thesis. And that's all from my side. And I'm happy to answer your question. Thank you very much. Reza, do we have any question on site? There is no question online. I have just one quick question because you have the emphasis on life. So what means life? Life is life, you know, <laughs> streaming is right now. Online. So what is... Uh, the live streaming is a type of the streaming that the media and the video is uh, broadcasted simultaneously as it's uh, produced. Okay, good. Thank you very much. And there is one more thing before we conclude this session. And this is the talk by Reza. And I'm sure he is already ready and will start sharing his screen. Uh, which is about CDN and SDN support and player interaction for HTTP adaptive video streaming. Hello, everyone. My name is Reza, PhD researcher at the University of the Lagenford. And today I'm pleased to present uh, my uh, accepted paper entitled CDN and SDN support and player interaction for HTTP adaptive video streaming. The agenda of this presentation includes introduction. Uh, after that, I will talk about uh, some uh, key research question and uh, present uh, some state of the art and standard reports. After that, I will talk about uh, my uh, publication and future work. Let's uh, a little bit talk about uh, the key technology that we use in uh, dissertation. As you know, video traffic has become the dominant traffic over the internet. And uh, according to Cisco statistic, it will be uh, more than 82% of uh, whole internet traffic by 2022. HTTP adaptive video streaming is considered as a de facto technology over the internet. In this technology, as you can see in the figure, uh, the total video is uh, segmented into a small chunks or small uh, segment, 
then encoded into multiple quality or multiple bitrate call representation and store in a HTTP adaptive streaming server, uh, I mean the CDN servers or origin server. And according to uh, has capability, has client's capability, uh, it will be adapt uh, to the client's uh, bandwidth or uh, play your pop. But uh, what is the challenge in has domain? Uh, the most uh, the most existing uh, HTTP adaptive streaming technology are related to the, the pure client based approach. So in this approach, there is not sufficient information about the network as a result uh, lead to a suboptimal address, uh, suboptimal adaptation decision. Some efforts uh, propose network assisted approach. In this scheme, the decision is performed via a centralized network component with a holistic view of the network. So thanks to the, this technology, we can be more beneficial for, uh, for uh, the user's QOE. Uh, and uh, some research reveals that uh, fundamental paradigms of modern technology, uh, like softwareization or visualization, edge computing or fog computing, uh, can be used in modern network assisted framework. Let's a little bit talk about software defined network as a paradigm of a 5G or fifth generation of network. As you know, in the traditional network, the data plane are and, in, uh, and the control plane uh, are uh, integrated in one devices. But uh, in this uh, technology, I mean the SDN, the control plane and data plane are decoupled from each other and control plane as a heart of the network uh, is placed in a one uh, layer called control plane layer or, uh, or SDN controller. So thanks to this technology, some problems like complex network devices, management overhead and limited uh, scalability uh, solved. And we, as an administrator or designer of the network, uh, we have a central network uh, controller and management and a standard communication interface, et etc. Cetera, et cetera. But uh, what is the main challenge of my uh, research and my thesis? Uh, I want to uh, design some network assisted uh, video streaming service. But for this code, uh, I should know how SDNs and CDNs provide assistance for HTTP adaptive streaming client to improve media delivery service. As you can see in this figure, uh, some information from, uh, from the CDN side, like uh, cache map or cache occupancy, or uh, information provided by the SDN controller, like uh, the, the available bandwidth that provide by the uh, by uh, monitoring technology can be used uh, to assist the client side for having a precise uh, adaptation decision for the next second. Uh, as another question, I want to know, will assistant by has client for the SDNs and CDNs and client network contribution um, work and which assistant and how we can use this uh, assistant uh, technology for this purpose. So the SDN controller could use some information provided by the client side, like user behavior, user request pattern, etc., etc. Uh, for some specific networking and uh, CDN tasks like caching dynamic uh, routing policy. Uh, another thing we can use the information provided uh, from the client side, also client uh, capability to uh, have a hybrid peer to peer and CDN. So by this technology, we can uh, support low latency video streaming, improving network bandwidth usage and enhancing CDN performance uh, and uh, finally we can improve uh, quality of experience uh, parameters from the user side. Another research question is what is the utility of the proposed assistant and collaboration service? In, uh, the, uh, after designing a network assisted system with the mentioned uh, first and second research question, we always measure the uh, QOE parameters, CDN utilization, QoS parameters, network utilization, SDN controller load. I mean, the message to from uh, the control, the controller, and measuring the load and overhead of the control. Also, content providers cost. 
So the simulation, emulation, and testbed experiment are considered as a utility uh, that uh, we use in uh, evaluation part of our experiment. As a state of the art, there are some efforts in a standard like uh, IETF Alto, also MPEG SAM. Also, uh, there is a, a vendor uh, technology like a net session, Akamai net session. But however, uh, uh, there is not a straightforward and clear message communication for SAM, also Alto, and uh, net session needs to install an uh, application on the client side. Uh, to solve this challenge, we propose ESHAS, an edge and SDN assisted framework for HTTP adaptive video streaming. As you can guess, this is a network assisted uh, video streaming framework, but it's a little bit different from a state of the art because we don't need to uh, modify the client side code and it's compatible with any type of HTTP adaptive streaming adaptation uh, in the client side. Uh, this paper is accepted in ACM NOSTOF. The main idea of this paper is uh, utilizing the SDN, NFP, and edge computing technology and introducing one component at the edge of the network called virtual reverse proxy. In our virtual reverse proxy, we introduce a new server segment selection policy. During the uh, cache hit, we try to uh, serve the client request in the uh, VRP from the best cache servers in terms of the fetch time. But when we encounter the cache miss, we use the uh, concept uh, that introduced in uh, CMCDS standard uh, and we call it replacement quality. And we try to uh, overwrite uh, the client's request. Uh, you can find more information about experiment and real implementation, including 60 clients in the paper. In another paper, we called it CSDN, CDN Aware QA Optimization in SDN Assisted HTTP Adaptive Video Streaming, uh, that uh, is accepted in the IEEE LCN. And we try to equip uh, our virtual reverse proxy introducing ESHAS. So, in this approach, we try to uh, introduce another segment server selection policy by utilizing two types of activity. One of them called like ES has uh, fetching, uh, fetch, fetch base action, another one called transcoding based action. So at the edge of the network, uh, we uh, not only uh, try to serve client request from the uh, best cache server, but also we try to transcode client request during uh, cache miss uh, situation. As you can see in the figure, we could outperform traditional approach and another network assisted uh, system called SABR. And in uh, both uh, frameworks, we didn't uh, modify the client side code. Uh, as ongoing and future work, we have multiple uh, in progress work. Uh, for example, we uh, design a network assisted system for hash, has clients that use edge collaboration technique. Another work uh, and uh, efforts, we try to uh, design a hybrid peer-to-peer -peer CDN system to provide low latency live video streaming service with uh, edge uh, capability. Another uh, work uh, tries to uh, design a network assisted has system to improve users QoE by optimizing a set of video representation. The output of this uh, work uh, is some parameters uh, from the um, compression part, and we try to optimize bitrate ladder uh, that uh, store in a CDN server, also the origin server. Thank you for your attention. Uh, I will be happy to answer your questions. Thank you. There is no online question, but maybe something on site. If not, I'd like to thank all the speakers, those on site and those remote. I think this was a very interesting, although very packed session, which ran also um, out of time. But hopefully you still uh, appreciated the interesting new thesis that are coming up in the next years. Uh, and I wish you all a very good time at Enensis, specifically those uh, being there on site. And hopefully see you all 
uh, at MMSUS at a similar doctoral symposium, maybe next year. Thank you very much and enjoy the conference. <laughs>